Welcome to our program, Running for City Council. We would like to acknowledge that Coquitlam Public Library provides service on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Swilitooth, Katsi, Musqueam, Kakite, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Amin, and, and that is Anne. And we would like to thank you for joining us tonight for this informative session with the Mayor and City Councilors. <laughs> um, so we'd like to introduce Mayor Stewart, who has been a mayor since the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Councillor Terry Towner, no. Councillor Dennis Barnston, Councillor Craig Hodge, and Councillor Steve Kim. So tonight we will have an opportunity to find out what it takes to become a city councillor in Coquitlam. So we'll be hearing from each councillor and mayor who will get an opportunity to tell us their journey and why they chose to do the, the route they did. So let's get started. Um, maybe starting with the mayor. Uh, why did you decide to run for city council and then mayor? So in, in the 90s I was a consultant related to housing. In fact my career was in housing and the uh, uh, leader of the opposition at the time in the provincial government asked me to consider running. I immediately said no, you'd have to be an idiot to be in politics. Um, he, he thanked me for the assessment of his role in politics, and uh, but eventually he did uh, convince me and others convinced me and my wife and I had a discussion, we thought we'd run provincially. Um, I got elected uh, into a very hyper-partisan reality that is the provincial government. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. We got some good stuff done, but there was lots of other things that you ended up um, ended up happening that you, I'm not supportive of necessarily, and that's the reality of partisan. When uh, after four years, I was asked by the mayor of the day to run for council instead, uh, which I did. Um, I was elected; he wasn't, um, and, and as a result, I was a city councillor. I had some strong differences with the mayor who was elected, and we um, went through that. I decided to retire from politics and go back to the, the better gig that I had before. Um, but I was convinced by a colleague to, well, if, I, if I'm not running anyway, why don't you run against the mayor? We could uh, solve that. And I uh, ran against uh, Maxine, and, and I won um, and in 2008. And that's uh, ultimately how I ended up being on uh, council and how I ended up being as mayor was primarily to get out of partisan politics and to be an independent. Uh, uh, we are a council of independence and I find that incredibly valuable, incredibly helpful to the process that we are involved in. And, uh, and we, I, I love working with a group of independent council members. You're gonna pass it along to Jerry. <coughs> Thank you. So the question is, how did we get started? Yes. Okay. Why did you choose to run for city council? Okay. Hi, everyone. I never had an aspiration whatsoever to be an elected official. I had a career in human resources that I loved, and I worked at a, 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 in a, a big utility company. And one day I walked in, and I got I found out I was reorganized out of my job after over 17 years, which was sad for me because I really loved my job. I got really good severance, so I thought, you know what, we'll just stick the severance in a separate bank account and just keep drawing it so I'm still paid. And ever since I was about 12, or as far as I can remember, I've always had way too much energy, and I've always directed that energy to being involved in my community. Volunteering, coaching, playing things, helping people out. I've never watched TV. I did learn how to use Netflix during the COVID pandemic. And anyways, so while we were living off, this, off the severance, I just dug my teeth deeper into the community. My kids were still in school, and when they were in school nine to three every day, I was out filling food bank hampers or doing something. And then I was approached and asked by a couple people in the community, including a city councillor, 
the, what I consider running for council, and I did the same as Mayor Stewart, and I laughed. Me, a politician? I am not a politician. And, um, well, it's not like politics, it's not partisan, there's no parties, you can just serve the community, and you already do that. I was taking pictures for Snap Coquitlam, writing stories, I was out in the community pretty much every day doing something anyways. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I love my city, I love people. It was way out of my comfort zone, I have to tell you. Um, the first run even the by-election in 2013 was really out of my comfort zone. I, I shook for the whole day leading up to my first all candidates meeting. I shook all the way through it. And, uh, but I did it, didn't get elected in the by-election in 2013. But I realized on the doorsteps and at the all candidates meetings and talking to people that I really had a lot of pride in my city. Didn't know all the issues to the depth that I do now, like the challenges and how things are done. But uh, I've never looked back. I attended every council meeting between the by-election and the general in 2014 and got elected in 2014. And this is the end of my second term. So if I wasn't approached and asked, I wouldn't have done it because it was never on my list, but I'm really glad that I it was. So uh, I ran for office, uh, my, my background is in finance, I was in banking for quite a number of years, um, got involved with the Chamber of Commerce and was seconded to a policy committee. And uh, through my youth I was a, a hockey referee, so rules and policy was something I was quite familiar with. So it was really interesting um, getting involved in policy and actually engaging at a provincial or a federal level, um, advocating for small business or large business to the to senior levels of government. So I, I, I became very intrigued in that. Um, <clears throat> fast forward, I was the Chamber of Commerce president, um, made a speech one night, I walked off the stage, and a gentleman said, we have plans for you. Mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter, I was approached about running provincial. So much like uh, Mayor Stewart, well, you know, that seems interesting. And, you know, it's again, it's a chance to, to make a difference in people's lives and, and, and work with policy. And so let's, let's give it a shot. And uh, so I did. And um, as I say to my son, I finished second because he was devastated that I didn't win. Um, I should have lost by a whole lot more, but I didn't. Um, and so I just uh, returned back to my, my finance career and everything was fine and good. And, but people would just approach me from time to time and say, you know, um, we need your voice. We need a, a business mind around the council table. We need a policy mind around the council table. Um, and, uh, and we think you can, you can bring that. So the piece that I found most intriguing having run provincially and now run successfully, municipally, is the words that come out of my mouth at the council table are mine, which is really cool because we don't have parties. You know, uh, you can look and say, this is, you know, I've, I've listened to the, the residents, I've formed my opinion, and here's what it is. Uh, my views aren't shaped by a poli-sci major in a back room who said, this is what the party stance should be. So I get to actually listen to the residents directly, form an opinion, and uh, bring it forward. So it's a, it's a very cool space. Um, we're one of the few cities that still is truly independent. Well, we may have some alignments in perhaps some of our histories or some of our opinions. Um, the manner in which we go about it, I think, is, is really collaborative to, uh, to get us there. So it's a, it's a good environment to work with. Great, thanks. So um, I grew up in Coquitlam, moved here when I was uh, six years old. I don't know how many years ago that was, but I went to a lot, a lot. okay, a lot. So I went to elementary school, went to Hillcrest Elementary School, Charles Best, the year that he was a secondary school, junior secondary school, and then I went on to Centennial. And while I was at Centennial, I became interested in photography, and, uh, and I began a career as a, as a newspaper photographer here in, in Coquitlam, and worked in a paper daily in Coquitlam called the Columbia Newspaper, and uh, if, you, if you look it up, there's a lot of pictures in the archives from, from the, back then, but uh, um, when that paper went out of business, I helped start the Tri-City News, and so for about 20 years, I worked for the for the Tri-City News and got to know the community and uh, had a great career. Worked for the Vancouver Sun as, as a while, and so I learned a lot about a lot about the community, and, uh, and I really enjoyed being active in the community. And 
at that time started doing a lot of volunteer uh, work. I, I run a scout troop up in Burke Mountain, still do, even though my kids have uh, gone through the program. But uh, I was involved in a lot of committees, uh, served in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I was the president of the Chamber of Commerce, like uh, like Dennis was. And uh, so I had some experience on boards, but uh, I had never really thought about running for, for uh, politics of any type. And, and once in a while, I'd sort of get interested in it. My, my boss would sort of, uh, just around election time, would knock on the door and say, just remember, you work for a newspaper, you can't run for office and work for a newspaper. And that usually ended the discussion. And in around 2011, the newspaper industry was, was changing, and it was uh, pretty evident that there wasn't going to be a, a, jo a full-time job for, uh, for photographers. And uh, so at that time, I decided it was time to look for something new. And uh, thought, well, okay, you know, what's what's out there? I want to stay active in the community. And then this this sort of one night, I had this thought: was what if I cross to the dark side? What if I go from <laughs> journalism to politics? And everybody thought, oh, this is this is crazy. And it was <clears throat> besides, you know, most people, it's it's hard first time getting elected. And uh, but you know, give it a try. And you know, a lot of people wish me well. And I had no idea about running for office. I didn't know. I simply said, oh, you got to get some signs brochure, you know, and you know, you know, let people know you're running. And so I knew a little bit about newspapers and advertising, and so that, that helped me. But uh, more, I think, what really helped was the fact that I, I knew the community. I've been doing some volunteer work. I, I reached out to a couple of counselors that I knew and, and Mayor Stewart, because through my newspaper work, I, I knew most of the people in office. And I've been to a lot of uh, yeah, city. I've been in a lot of council meetings, mostly crouched in the corner taking pictures, wondering when's this going to end. Um, so I had a pretty good idea of, of what I was getting in for. And uh, but you know what? I, when I got elected, it was it was an amazing experience because I had, I had an opportunity once again to be active in my community. It was it was like the ultimate board because you you get to actually make meaningful decisions. And and I think the best thing about it is is was was independent. And others have said, you know, being an independent counselor and being able to speak your mind and say what you think is really unique experience. We're the largest city in BC that does not have political parties. And, and that's really special here at Coquitlam. And the other thing that's really special is we all get along really well together. We're You've probably noticed we're already joking around with each other. That's what it's like. I mean, this is really a great atmosphere on this council. We're very fortunate. A lot of councils aren't like that. But we can walk into a room, all sit down together, have a great time, talk to each other. We can't talk about policy and stuff because there's limits. We have to save that for the council table. But we, this is a really a great council. And I think our community has served really well by the people that we have on council. I'm really pleased that I'm able to be part of that. Yes, thank you. Hi, hey, everyone. In your hand. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Steve Kim, um, and I'm in my first term. Um, and uh, I guess it just hearing the stories, uh, my, mine is somewhat similar in, in a lot of ways. Um, my, well, I guess how far do I go back? Um, <laughs> Go back as far as you want. I was conceived on a very My parents came to Canada in the late 60s, uh, and they were some of the first Koreans here in the Lower Mainland. Um, and it really kind of shaped a lot of the things my brother and I had gone through. They got married in Vancouver, or were born in Vancouver, and lived throughout uh, the Lower Mainland. Um, but uh, they were small business people. Um, they opened a Korean restaurant, a Korean food store. Um, but in 1981, they wanted to uh, provide, uh, move into an area that they could raise their children. Um, and they moved to Coquitlam in 1981. I was uh, just uh, was probably around eight years old at that point in time. Attended Meadowbrook, went to Charles Best, and then uh, graduated from Centennial as well. Um, and for me, at that point in time, I, I, I left Coquitlam to go to school. Uh, went and continue, out east, continued on, um, and did my grad studies out in Asia as well before coming back uh, to the Lower Mainland. And I uh, was in the tech sector working uh, in communications, um, but something happened in the early 2000s for me, myself. I, I started volunteering quite a bit in the community. And uh, I focused my volunteer effort into two areas, uh, one for the Korean Canadian community, um, in addition to uh, my other activity with the, the, the marketing association here in the province. 
And I, at that point in time, when I look back at it, I was actually volunteering more than focusing on my business at times. And it's what drove me. And uh, to be honest, I was quite happy and satisfied with uh, where things were going. Um, but uh, something happened in 2013. Um, it was roughly two months before the provincial election. And at that point in time, uh, I was asked if I would consider running in Coquitlam and Um And just like my, my colleagues, uh, that, at that first suggestion, I was like, no way. Like, what, what's going on here? Um, you know, it's, uh, it was a bit of a, a disruption to me to think that this would be something for myself. Um, but after two weeks or so of um, thinking it over, um, talking with my family, uh, thinking about my parents uh, here, uh, my brother raising his family here as well, and the three, three generations, uh, it's something that resonated with me that uh, I decided uh, to give this a shot. Um, Coquitlam Mayardville as a riding is where I grew up, um, so if there is ever a riding for me to be involved in, it would be in that particular one. And um, it was, uh, we had basically seven weeks for that campaign, um, and uh, something uh, incredible happened on election day. I, I had won on election day. Um, and by roughly, I think at that point it was uh, around 130 votes or so, um, uh, it triggered a judicial recount, and uh, roughly three or four weeks later, uh, the final tally came in, and I lost by 41 votes. Uh, so it switched, but um, for me, it I had to reflect on what I wanted to do, but um, I thought I had to continue. Um, and my goal at that point was to try again in four years, for 2017. Um, and uh, we know in 2017, it, again, it, it did not work in this time. Uh, after that election, I, I sat back and really wanted to reflect on what this whole experience was and where did I want to go with it. And I was pretty much ready to uh, go back into my, my business again and, and my volunteer work. Um, but uh, uh, after some discussions with some colleagues here now um, and some others, um, I really started to think back on my experience as a candidate and uh, two things that really stood out for me and one was that uh, over that four year stretch I got incredibly hyper local with residents um, from the door knocking and to my conversations that the, the matters that really affected them such as uh, the, the changing housing needs, um, the infrastructure concerns that they had through uh, the growth of the city um, I, I started to really think that the, my impact would be at the local level. Um, and on the second part of that was I was also a recovering partisan at that point in time and, uh, and how much I enjoyed the fact of watching the council of that day uh, as independents and uh, the work that they were doing, uh, collaborating with each other. Um, made me realize that uh, really that is more in tune with uh, my personality and character and uh, something that I wanted to be a part of. Um, so from that, uh, I still was probably near the end of 2017, early 20, uh, 2018, um, when I started to really give it some, cons um, some strong thought. Um, and probably around spring of 2018 was when I made the choice that I was ready to uh, make a push again, um, but this time at the local level, and I can tell you, um, it has been the best choice uh, for me personally. Um, it is an incredible privilege and honor for me to serve in the city that raised me, um, and my brother, and, and uh, now his, uh, my nephew and niece, uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's a tremendous feeling for me to represent. Um, uh, certainly there is an element uh, for myself to see uh, my ability to represent um, parts of our community that uh, uh, are growing side of our community that can get involved and see what, uh, uh, how they might be able to engage with our city as well. And uh, so I take a little bit of pride in that uh, to show that uh, we have some diverse representation on our council as well. Um, and uh, you know, I can't believe it's already been three and a half years. Um, but uh, 
I'll, I'll close uh, in saying that uh, I too just enjoy uh, the makeup of our council, the independent nature that we have, um, and our ability to work together so that we can make the decisions for our city. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're just going to ask a couple of general questions about so anyone can choose to answer one of because um, I think these are questions that most people have and they don't really know what the requirements are. So things like, what are the requirements to become an elected official? Anyway. You have to be a citizen, and that's it. Yeah. Not even a resident of Coca-Cola? Nope. nope. You have to be 18 and over. Huh? You do so have, I could run now. You yeah, do have to saying. get a certain number of residents assigned to nomination. Okay. And there's 10, 10. And basically, there's enough in this room. But that's, <laughs> that's really it. There was actually a number of years ago, there was an individual that ran for council in every city in Metro Vancouver. Oh, okay. He didn't have an intent of winning any of them, but he was just trying to make a statement. Not sure what that statement was, but anyway. Hmm. No, he so, had 10 signatures. <laughs> if you don't have 10 friends, don't run for council. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, he, 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 we, we, we talked a lot um, at the Union of BC Municipalities, which is when uh, the, this uh, elected officials get together uh, and, and talk about frameworks and criteria. Uh, we've talked about uh, criminal record checks. We've talked about um, really establishing standards and expectations. Um, but that's, that's, that's a really tough piece to put on because uh, you want to be as open to everybody to be there. I mean, so. Um, if, if you have a passion for, for the community, if you have at least 10 friends, um, it would be helpful in Coquitlam to have another 9,990 <laughs> of them, because um, typically it's around the 10,000 votes to, to get elected in, in Coquitlam. Um, so, but it's really just a matter of, of having that passion, having that connection, um, showing to the residents that are out there that you care and that you've got some sort of connection. Uh, and then you're bringing a skill set that maybe is needed. If you look at all of us around, the, the five of us that are here right now, we all bring something slightly different. Terry's HR background. Um, Craig with his, his community connections and, and, uh, and photography, telling and storytelling. Richard with housing, myself in finance, Steve with marketing. Uh, he's, he's looking around the table and seeing what's there and how can you provide value. So in Coquitlam, one of the things that people, residents, seem to want is to put people in these chairs that want to work together. Negative politics have failed in Coquitlam, and party slate politics have failed. Richard was on one, I volunteered for it, it failed. The other side of the political spectrum tried one, it failed. Our residents tend to want folks that are going to be independent and listen and talk to you. Sorry, quick question. For the 10 signature, do they have to live in? Yes, yes they have to be residents. Okay. Voters. Well, you don't have to be, they have to be. They have to be. <laughs> <laughs> and some people just go door to door. It's easy to find 10 people, but think you're okay. Do they have or to think you're crazy sure. and they're criticized <laughs> anyway. Just wanted to be sure. Do we have to live in Coquitlam for more than like a half year? No, no. You don't even have to live in Coquitlam. You're good. <laughs> I did not know that. Question is, what did it take financially to become? You know, most it doesn't have to, you don't have to actually spend any money, you know, to put your name on the ballot. But to take a serious run of council, you're going to need to do some, you know, advertising. Um, you know, that's that's really that's all you need to do. Uh, there's a couple of things that are that are sort of I think really important. Uh, one is to have a really good brochure. So you need something that you can drop at the door. Um, the other thing is that our city is unique in that our city, the city itself, puts together a, a mail-out package that and all the candidates who are running are allowed to pay for a portion of the mailing. So instead of trying to mail your brochure or deliver it to 65,000 homes, you can put it into the package and it costs around two or $3,000 for the mailing and then another you know, maybe four thousand dollars for the uh, to get the brochures printed, and a lot of candidates print extras so that they have them for their their door knocking. But really, if you're going to be serious at council, really a good brochure and plan to have it delivered as part of the package. Uh, that that would probably be the key thing. And then if you've got some extra money, signs. Uh, 
I, you know, I'm not sure about the signs. I, you know, I, I helps with awareness, but the brochure is is the key. Having a really good brochure and making sure that you deliver it, or get a whole lot of friends to deliver it door to door. You can do it that way as well. But that's that's your key. I, if you you can go online and you can look at under the elections BC. You can look at the financial disclosure statements for the last couple of elections, and you can see how much each candidate spent. And uh, but they're in around ten thousand to twenty would be well, I'll get this, but, but a minimum of ten. Yeah, I guess to do the brochure, but most of it's spent. You can go look. I mean, I think they ranged anywhere from ten to about thirty-five thousand is where the range was. But uh, be prepared to spend at least ten to do a good brochure and get it delivered. And social media costs nothing, right? Um, <laughs> Councilor Hodge answered that very well, but it does, that that money isn't your own personal money. The maximum that you can contribute to your own campaign is twelve hundred dollars. The maximum that any individual can contribute to your campaign is twelve hundred dollars, unless you set aside twelve hundred dollars last year. And the year before that, like some people have, so they may have forty-eight hundred dollars or something heading in. Um, but you, the most you, so it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or not. You can't bankroll a huge campaign. You have to fundraise the money. So I don't know if that was more of the question. Like how much does it cost you? It's Twelve hundred dollars max. I think in general, how much would it cost you? Um, I'm still using my lawn signs from 2013. I, don't I put my picture on because I wanted people. I don't genderize things, but I wanted you people to know changed. that I'm a woman. <laughs> yes, I have. So my picture is on my lawn sign, and I don't look at that anymore. But I'm going to use them again because my, it's still my name, it's still my face, and it, it's keeping the signs out of the landfill. But they make you, anyways. It looks like I spent more, but I didn't because I bought the signs two campaigns ago, but they still make me include the cost, but that's just the Campaign Financing Act. I would say 12000 minimum for a brochure, the mail-out, and other stuff, feeding your volunteers on eBay. Uh, there's a bigger part to the question, because the rules have changed. In 2014 was the last unrestricted election related to campaign finance, and that was the election where the successful candidates, I think the lowest spending were you two maybe, of the successful council candidates? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, of the successful was lowest spending, spent 20 grand. In 20 grand. Yeah, 18. And so the, those who got elected paid, spent about 20 or more in 2014. Uh, the highest spending was uh, Chris at uh, $38,000. Um, but back then you could take uh, donations from labor unions, which Chris got a lot of, or uh, businesses, which lots, all of the council got lots of, and that sort of stuff. So you could, you could take union and corporate donations. You can't anymore. Now it's all individuals. And that was meant, theoretically, to level a playing field and to restrict the amount of influence that corporates and unions had on politics. The challenge, though, is that it made it almost impossible for some people to run, because if you have a circle of friends that can, uh, say 20 friends that can give 1200 bucks um, to your campaign, you're probably um, in the top 20% of the community's socioeconomic roles. If your circle of friends, though, is, say, single parents that you meet at, at, at your child's school or something like that, you're, you may have a lot more difficulty getting even one $1,200 contribution. It's probably not, and we hear this from candidates all the time, it's just not in the cards. I don't have that circle of friends. So it, it, it is a challenge financially, and, is, and there, there is no question that I, don't, I can't, don't think anyone has ever been elected to go to council without having a brochure in that envelope uh, uh, two weeks before election day. Uh, and that does cost, I guess, 4,800 bucks in postage for your share of the, or something like that. To get 65,000 printed is probably about 400 bucks. Um, and, you know, the, and that's a simple brochure. So uh, you're, you're pretty close to 10,000 just getting into that envelope. Um, and then uh, if you want signs, they're 12 bucks each or something like that. So um, it, it can be a challenge. 
um, under the new rules particularly, but that said, um, it's, if you can uh, make that, then um, give serious thought to it, because the things that my colleague said, that um, Coquitlam has embraced positive and it has rejected um, parties. Uh, I ran in a party when I was first recruited to, as, as uh, Dennis said, I, I was recruited to a group called Coquitlam First. It was run by the mayor and that was his group. And I couldn't have run anyway. I had a back injury and I could barely walk. Um, I was not in a door knocking frame of mind. I walked, walked with two canes. Uh, so I was on the on this team, and I was the only one on the team that got elected, uh, including the mayor. And the mayor did not get elected. So and that was a rejection, I thought, of that uh, party system. And the last one we ran in 2014 was similar, a party that didn't get elected. Um, uh, I think two of them got elected out of the five. And that's just the reality of COVID. <coughs> Coquitlam seems to prefer independent candidates that can work together. There are lots of jurisdictions, though, where the loudest and most critical candidate, the negative politics, does work in, um, and we'll probably see that in Surrey, and we'll see it in Vancouver, because those two communities have traditionally had that. Uh, we're lucky in Coquitlam, from my perspective anyway, that uh, we're able to get a council to work together. Can I add a comment? Yeah, I think uh, this year the uh, personal contribution maximum is uh, 1250, and also there's an expand limit for each candidate, which is, I, I believe, this year is uh, by $50,001. So even if you raise more than that money, you can only spend it. Yeah, okay. yeah. They, they, they have changed, they imposed a spending limit. It's, I think, 50,000 for candidates, yeah. and uh, for council for candidates, council. and 100,000 or something like 90,000 90, for mayor. Um, I won't be spending anywhere near that. And I never have, even when the, there was no restriction and, the, and donations were easier. Um, there, there will be no one that will spend uh, anywhere near the limit from uh, running, running for council this time. So, yeah. And, and then just to add, you know, we've talked, we've thrown up some numbers that are anywhere from 12 to, to 35,000. Um, the amount you spend didn't necessarily, if you look at the elections and where people placed and how much they spent, there's not a direct correlation between that. We've seen people spend a lot and finish near the bottom. We've seen people spend less and finish near the top. So so it's not a matter of the more you raise, the higher up you're, you're going to finish. And all the donations have to come from Coquitlam residents? No. Oh, yeah. oh, but, but I believe British Columbia, British Columbia, British Columbia, British Columbia residents. British Columbia residents. No so Russian bots. No, no, no Russian bots. <laughs> Doubt your family from Ontario. Yeah, so I'm going to spend a lot less this week. <laughs> <laughs> None of my rest. Okay, um, we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Okay, um, what are your responsibilities? Day to day. Uh, responsibilities? Uh, well, uh, certainly uh, it's. I divide my responsibilities uh, in, in various ways, but certainly um, being out there. Uh, you know, once a week, we before council, um, every Thursday evening we receive our information that we have to take in for Monday's council. Uh, and if you have the printed version, it can be a binder like this, uh, or the digital version, we get the PDF and, and then you start the reading. Um, and uh, you know, I, I was, I certainly learned from my colleagues during my first term, and you know, when you get that reading, uh, you spend your Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays uh, going around and, and basically uh, investigating and, and researching some of the, 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 the items that are going to be on the agenda, uh, or talking with uh, staff or, or and others so that you can get a better idea within that time frame. When I first joined council, <laughs> I realized that binder. I was like, this is. Remind me of university, and you're taking a semester's worth of information into four days, um, and your ability to uh, to take that all in. So, but I really wanted to get my fundamentals right. I'm, I'm not a city planner. I'm not a, a developer. I'm not an urban designer. I'm planner. So, 80% of our time and what we focus on is on land use and land use decisions. So, I really wanted to to get my fundamentals correct on learning. Um, about what I'm about to make a decision on. 
um, and of course, uh, uh, and, and, and broadening my uh, my skill set so that I can be uh, I can contribute to the conversation as well. Um, but outside of that, uh, certainly spend a lot of time uh, listening, um, going around to various uh, individuals, businesses, nonprofit groups, um, and uh, you know, and, and talking with parents and understanding the concerns that they might have on, on a longer term scale, but also on a shorter term scale, and and seeing how um, uh, you know what we as a city uh, can do to assist uh, if there are any concerns. And that's a lot of uh, matchmaking and putting people together uh, so that uh, they can also have the conversation and, and know that uh, someone is there to, to provide support. Um, and uh, outside of that, uh, you know, I, I, I think I myself, um, for my first term, wanted to focus on, again, learning everything about a city and Coquitlam. Uh, moving forward, uh, as my colleagues, uh, they have other responsibilities, which I'm sure they'll get into, that uh, involve regional contexts. Um, there's a, an organization called Metro Vancouver Regional District, and uh, obviously Coquitlam is a part of that, and uh, my colleagues uh, uh, sit at the table, and so they have additional responsibilities like that. And of course, I know uh, our mayor, you know, with, uh, uh, with TransLink, uh, he has additional responsibilities there in ensuring that uh, the right infrastructure is also built. Um, so uh, uh, I Looking ahead, certainly uh, these are some of the things that I would also like to be a part of uh, for my second term. But uh, uh, the learning curve is immense, um, and uh, but it's uh, it's all part of the program. It's uh, it, it really is uh, rewarding to uh, understand all the facets of our city. I think we'll just go to pass it. Do I just pass it down? Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's deal with the city, and you can maybe come sure. back. Okay. Perfect. So uh, as, as Steve has said, we've got uh, different different. Uh, Facets. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the city piece in terms of structure. So Steve's absolutely right. You get your your binder of information. You get your laptop, uh, and a light weekend will be 400 pages of reading. Um, a busier one will be 1,200, and then once a year you get budget, which is really fun. Uh, that's why I love it. It gets about 1,500 pages, and it's great. Favorite time of the year. Uh, I love it. Um, but in Coquitlam, we operate with what you refer to as a community of the whole. So uh, three Mondays a week. Uh, three Mondays a month, uh, we will get together and we'll typically start at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and we'll start with our committee meetings. So it's a committee to hold. Some cities look and say, here's a sports committee, here's a transportation, here's a parks and rec transportation planning. We do it all together uh, and everybody's around it. Some cities will assign specific individuals. We do it together. That way, everybody's involved in the dialogue, everybody's involved in decision making. Um, it's, seems to be a very cohesive way of uh, making things work. So we'll start out with our committees, uh, and, and then, we'll, then we'll go into uh, what is referred to in camera meetings, where there's information that we're discussing about uh, land that's not ready for public, or legal issues uh, that is not ready for public. We'll have discussions there, and then at seven o'clock, uh, we start a council meeting. Again, there, there's the, again, another public session where we're actually, that's our decision-making time. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we have a number of committees uh, within the city. We have a sport, we have a multicultural committee, we have a cultural service advisory committee, we have an economic development advisory. We've got about, I think it's about eight or ten different committees. He was describing the committee in the whole as a standing committee of council. Yeah. He's now describing the advisory committees, which are citizen committees. Which are made up of citizens. And so we will typically have one or two of those advisory committees that we serve as either a chair or vice chair on. And then typically every other month, you'll be chairing or vice chairing a meeting where you're actually engaging staff presentations to residents, getting their feedback, getting perspective in there. So from a responsibility perspective, um, the neat part of, in the way we do it is you can really engage in the pieces that fit your skills the best. Um, so I know when I first got elected, again, finance background, uh, Craig would look to me and say, okay, well, you did some of the finance stuff, okay, but uh, Craig in some of his other capacities is, is very much involved in parks. So um, we've broken it down, there's advisory for, for residents, and, and then we uh, work together with our committee the whole. Um, Steve alluded to some stuff at the Metro Van. Um, 
Craig and Richard are, are both board members uh, with Metro Vancouver. I'll turn over to Craig to talk a little bit about what that means. Sure, thanks. And I, just before I talk, Metro, a couple of other things you've probably heard the term public hearing. Uh, we have uh, usually one public hearing a month. We, we don't the summer, but uh, so about 10 of those a year. We had one last night, and we usually put that in right at the start of the council meeting. So last night's public hearing went for about two hours, so we actually didn't get our council meeting going till after nine o'clock. So that can happen on some meetings, but uh, generally, as Steve said, your, your binder arrives on a Thursday night, you start reading it. One, I, I saved all my binders in one year. At the end of the year, I took all the papers out of the binder and I stacked the papers up and it was higher than me. So that was a year's worth of reading. Um, and, uh, and then through the week, there's a lot of emails and correspondence and community events, things like this. And, um, you know, as I said, as Dennis said, you've got committee meetings that you attend. Um, Richard and I serve on the board of Metro Vancouver, which is a, it's a federation of uh, 21 municipalities, plus an electoral area and a, and a First Nation. And they, they look after regional things like water, sewer, uh, garbage uh, disposal, uh, regional parks like uh, Colony Farm and Minicata. So in, uh, in most of council sits on one of their committees. Uh, for example, I, I sit on uh, Parks and uh, Parks Committee, and I sit on the, the Zero Waste Committee. So most of us, and I just can tell you the, the committees that they that they sit on. But uh, that is a regional responsibility over and above uh, what we do at uh, the council table. And some of us sit on different associations as well, like uh, UBCM is something that I do. Uh, you can either take the mic and call. <laughs> Want to, Who is it? Chuck, you want to talk about Yeah, we get a lot of phone calls, too. <laughs> At all times of the day. Um, and so, Craig got all the way to UBCM. There's a, there are three um, federations of municipalities at the local, provincial, and uh, but not on delivery of services, but rather on policies. Uh, the local government, the Lower Mainland the Local Government Association, the U Union of BC Municipalities, or the BC Association of Municipalities, effectively, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, some of us just came back from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the FCM's conference in Regina, that deals with federal issues from a municipal perspective, because a lot of our stuff gets funded by federal governments, or uh, uh, sewage treatment is managed by uh, the federal government, or the standards are set by federal government, and those sorts of things. So we have lots of interaction with other local governments that uh, are really, really important. Um, the regional government does, as, as Craig described, it is, I, I'm in, uh, I chair the most important committee at the regional government, the Committee of Flushes. Uh, it's the Liquid Waste Committee. It's an important function of Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver stores fresh water up in the mountains and delivers its municipalities for distribution and then takes, collected by municipalities in pipes, takes sewage and transports it to, to uh, regional governments, uh, Metro Vancouver's sewage treatment plants, and then it discharges back into receiving waters. Similarly, garbage, we collect it, and or our contractor does, and it gets transferred to a regional facility for ultimate disposal in uh, Metro's incinerator or in a landfill facility. So that regional government role is really, really important as well, and we all have to have a function there. Um, I also, because the governance of TransLink is by the mayor's council, TransLink mayor's council on regional transportation, TransLink, therefore, I have meetings about once a month, although sometimes once every week, uh, for TransLink. So I have once calculated my, my hours, this is pre-COVID, um, as mayor I was doing about 70 hours a week in, at my work, which includes weekends, so it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, it's seven days a week though, and that's every member of council has something that every night if they accepted uh, things, they would always be away from, that's why I have to leave in about five minutes because I promised my wife I'd be home. <laughs> um, uh, so, and TransLink is one of those functions where um, uh, the governance was established by a mayor's council and therefore the mayors have to work on a whole bunch of issues, including the development of the next phase of the uh, transportation plan for the region. Um, we just adopted last night 
Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver developed a regional growth strategy and RGS 2050 is Metro Vancouver, Metro 2050 is the plan for how to accept another million people that are likely going to try to move to Metro Vancouver. In fact, they will move here. Um, the challenge will be that either we build enough housing and have enough infrastructure for them, or else our children will probably be outbid for the housing and they'll move to Calgary. Um, so those are the what's at stake at the regional level to make sure that the region is ready. We're not trying to attract a million people, we just know that they're coming. And last year, actually, the, the province says it quite proudly, 100,000 people moved to British Columbia last year, more than ever before. Now, if that happened for the next 25 years, it wouldn't be a million people we're talking about, it's two and a half million. It'd be doubling the population of the, of the region. Uh, it would, of course, force a lot of the families that aren't landowners out of the, out of the province. They would have to move elsewhere. So there's a lot at stake in the responsibilities that local government has and regional and the various other functions uh, associated with trying to accommodate people and make the region worth living in. I won't think you're going to walk out while I'm speaking. I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, actually, there are a, a, few, a couple of things. In addition to getting our binder and getting familiar with all the data and being prepared to speak and vote at our council meetings and the advisory committee meetings, so just to give you an example, the um, advisory committees I'm on or the different bodies I'm, I represent is sustainability and environment, community safety, universal accessibility. I'm on the mental health task force, which is sort of chaired by the school district, homelessness and housing, like a, a, a wide variety of, of task forces and advisory committees. So that's just that. But, and Richard alluded to different events. The, my favorite part, I love policy, I love the advisory committees, all that. Emails, phone calls, meeting residents for coffee. But I was just thinking back in the last two weeks, besides Regina, what have I done? But it's the events. It's our vibrant, amazing community. It's going to the festivals and the fundraisers and the ribbon cutting and pouring tea for the seniors at the lunches and the Chinese festivals and the Persian festivals and the Festival du Bois and the sports groups and the, like there's so, we have so much going on in our city. And I just love interacting with all the people of all ages, giving out the awards at the library in the summer. Those invitations just came, came through. We help with that. There's every week, if I said yes to everything, and I pretty much do if I can. Um, my kids have been involved in sports, so if they make the provincials or something, I've had to decline city things, but I love that part of the job. And it's you're out at events, talking to people, and sometimes they will pull you aside because they have a question or they have a pothole on the street, who do I call to get that fixed, or you're, you know, you're wearing your counselor hat. But another thing that we do that wasn't really um, delved into is we advocate and educate. I, I did a Toastmaster speech in my club that explained what the different levels of government are responsible for. City got people get mixed up and they'll complain to us about opioid addiction or homelessness or the, the wait at the hospital when their nephew broke their arm was too long and they come to us for things that aren't our mandate. And you know, people don't know what federal is, provincial, civic, Metro Vancouver, school board, and a lot of the emails we get, and even last night at the public hearing, the things that come up, the questions come up that aren't part of the public hearing. We're not, that's not a city thing. So we educate, but when people are coming to us with these issues that are funded and as demanded of a different level of government, and it's a need in our community, we advocate for that. The homeless shelter. We, yes, the city donated the land, but it's funded and run by the province. So we, we see needs and we advocate at FCM, UBCM, for what we need to, to have a safe, you know, inclusive, accessible, like things that are beyond streets, sewers, libraries, parks, things that are city. So we do a lot of advocating. And then there's other things too. Years ago, I was at a conference and I learned about this thing called ride sharing. And I was fascinated that, wow, what a cool concept, that gap. Because I hear all the time that 
young people will go party downtown because they can't. There's nowhere to go around here. They do. But they, yeah, young people. But they can't get home. The SkyTrain stops. Cabs won't take them, and there's a safety issue there, and there's a gap. And I learned about ride sharing, and it's all over the world. But the government of the day just didn't want it here in BC, and it was a long thing. And I started to, the more I learned about it, I advocated for it. I was always on the news and on the radio. And then the new government came in, and they said, you know, you need to get your class four, and you have to jump through this hoop. And they were really not making it so we would get successful ride sharing here. So I went through all of that, got my class four, became an Uber driver, one of the first ones, became a Lyft driver, because I thought, you know, if I'm gonna advocate for something, I'm going to walk the talk. And then COVID hit, I love doing it. There really is, anyways, in the role as a city councillor, you hear of gaps or things in our city that aren't necessarily a city-related issue, but it's a gap in our city. And so you want to do what you can to improve the quality of life for the residents. And sometimes that can be asking for something at the council table that's over and above the current budget or work plan, but other times it's just being involved and being a voice and advocating to the different levels. And so those things that I just listed, it's, we're busy, but it's super rewarding. And, um, yeah. You're right, there was more to say. Each member of council has passions of their own. And it's wonderful seeing them embrace those passions, move forward to, uh, for Dennis, economic development, absolutely. Um, there's, there's, Terry uh, is now C, uh, executive director of the Tri-Cities Friends of Refugees. She worked with a lot of the Syrian families when they, when they were coming uh, and did some amazing uh, housing work. Um, you'll see each member of council have those passions and, uh, and be able to explore them in the new role, even if it's not local government related. There's nothing about refugees that particularly local government. Um, there's nothing, you know, you look at some of the, uh, you know, the passion that you're, for journalism and, and the sharing of information that uh, was Craig's career. Um, journalism has changed enormously. It's now everybody's an editor, everybody's a journalist, <laughs> and uh, social media is like one run on letter to the editor without an editor. Uh, it's just, and it can be nasty and uh, horrific. And, uh, and so I really ex I love professional journalism and I wish we could hold on to it for longer. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's great having Steve on council now. Um, Steve was our most recent addition. Uh, so that was Craig in 2011 and these two in 2014, uh, Steve in 2018. Um, uh, but uh, and Steve, of course, brings not just the reality that he is the first Korean-born or uh, Korean uh, uh, council member uh, in Coconut's history, but he also has tremendous passion for uh, uh, technology, for youth, uh, and for uh, uh, dancing. <laughs> he's, he, he's good at the first two. <laughs> So what is your favorite thing about being a city councillor? And what is your least favorite thing about being a city councillor? So, Richard, you were supposed to leave at 7. Is it now 7.30? I, I, I will give a 30-second answer now. Okay. It won't be 30. Don't be bold. Put the clock on it. It won't. <laughs> least favorite thing, politics. I hate politics. Okay. We can actually do public policy without having to be political and partisan. Um, the favorite thing, actually, is speaking to the residents and, and seeing the smiles on faces with the playground that we built or the new park facility or all of the work, that, the really good work, and uh, working with some great, great people. I kind of alluded already to what my favorite part is, and it's the people. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter if people come up to me in Como Lake Village yelling at me that I supported something that they don't support. I like hearing from all angles of people, but it's the people. But it's also, so I did this weird thing during the pandemic, I started to run, and I heard about this app that keeps track of your streets, and I ended up running every street, every meter of every street in Coquitlam, and then I did 
Port Moody and North Blancara and Poco. But anyways, while I was writing Coquitlam, I learned more about my city that I did not know. And I ran into residents, not literally, but I learned about parks and bridges with suspension up in Westwood Plateau and you know, variances and whatnot. But things that, eh, or things that I were contentious at the time, and then you look at it, that's an amazing development, or look at the joy in the, Anyways, it's very, really rewarding to see how many changes have, are in the city. And uh, anyways, I'm kind of rambling now, but it's, it's being able to make a decision, stand strong, even when there's, because you know it's the best thing. Only the people who are against something, generally speaking, come out to speak at a public hearing or email you. People who support something don't, don't take the time to email and phone and say, we support this, so it looks like community isn't supporting something because the 10 or 11 people that don't want it are the ones that come to the public hearing. But we have a vision that, okay, yeah, this is a couple trees are gonna come down or this or this, but it's the best decision for the future of the city. And it's rewarding to then see that we made the right decision. We didn't cave, we weren't political, we just stuck to our values and the vision for the city and did it. And um, I find that very rewarding. And we have amazing people in our community. Just one last thing, I'm really involved, as I spoke earlier, of volunteering. And the heart of Coquitlam, of the Tri-Cities, uh, the volunteering that's woven through everything that gets done, our park system, our cultural, our sports, we couldn't do it without volunteers. And I just love the people in our city and how giving and caring and thoughtful they all are. And being part of that. Least favorite thing, Karen. Oh. Oh yeah. You almost got out of that. <laughs> <laughs> my least favorite thing. Well, besides that, my newer. I gained a lot of weight in my first term. <laughs> a lot of sitting, a lot of learning curve, and it snuck up on me. I've lost most of it, um, but it, I don't, I don't know, least favorite thing. Oh, ha, ha I'll be funny. Don't be a middle-aged woman, be on council, get a divorce, and try to date. <laughs> you can't. So my least favorite thing was that I can't sometimes go in somewhere and just be Terry. Just be a runner. Just be a middle-aged woman. Just be a whatever. I, it's always, I, I don't always want, even though I love being a counselor, I don't always want to be wearing that hat. I, I might want to be at a dinner party and drink some wine and not talk about land use. I'm not saying I hate that, but I sometimes just want to be me and maybe go on a date. <laughs> and men wouldn't date me once they found out I was a politician. So. Anyways, that's my least favorite. Top that one. <laughs> Men won't date you either. <laughs> so um, I think the theme you're going to hear is, is it's about the people. So when when I was in finance, um, my my role was to help people buy their houses, um, buy their cars, uh, help help them plan for their future, their retirements, and, and do these things. So um, really. Uh, I always looked at it that I was making a difference in people's lives. Uh, and so when I decided I was going to run for council, I went to my CEO and I said, I'm going to run for council. I'm going to keep my job and run for council. And he says, oh, that's, oh, that's awesome. That is so great. He says, talk to the COO, but you got my blessing. Excellent. I go to the COO and he says, oh, you can't do both. There's no way you can have a full-time job and be a counselor. So, sorry, I can't support that. So he was a little surprised two days later when I had to my resignation. Um, and he said, well, why? And I said, because I want to make a difference in people's lives. He goes, but you're doing that here every day. I said, yeah, but you know, 20, 30, 40 people a month. I want to do something more. And so through this, uh, through the policy work that I love, through the planning stuff that we do, through the delivery of services, I truly, I can go to sleep every night and say that we are making a difference in people's lives. When we look and spend finally on the, the uh, rec center up in Northeast Coquitlam, it'll be $130 million in all probability. Um, but that's gonna serve 50,000 residents. We're, first we're creating the opportunity for 50,000 residents to have a home up there. And then we're creating the parks, the trails, the rec centers for them to raise their families. 
That's making a difference in people's lives. And that's cool. It's really cool. Um, and then you'll have something on the other end of the spectrum where somebody says, this is happening on my street, it's stupid, can you do something about it? And then you can listen, find out what the challenge is, connect them to the staff member that ultimately figures out what the solution is and then delivers it. Because that's what we do, we connect it. We're the decision makers, but we only have one employee. We have the city manager. Everybody else reports through a, a chain of command through that, that person. But the staff are the ones that are delivering it. So we've got these full-time equivalent about 1,300 people that are delivering the services that you use every single day. And we're just creating the framework for them to succeed. And making that happen, making that connection, is really fulfilling. So when a guy said to me, my back lane needs to be paved and it's terrible, blah, 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 we were able to identify the process he had to go through to get that done. Wasn't on the city's plans, so here's how you can still get it done. Um, he's happy. The dust in his, in his living room has been reduced as people drive up and down the lane. It makes a difference in his life. It seems not a lot, but it is. Um, least favorite? Saying no. Saying no to, to going to some of the stuff, because there is a lot to attend, and, and, and Terry talks about all the volunteerism to it. Um, I stepped away from a lot of that. I stepped away and said, you know what, my council role, the, uh, the work that I do, um, and my family take up so much time that I don't volunteer with the Hospital Foundation anymore. You know, I don't volunteer. I guess I volunteered with my son's soccer team for a while until he outgrew that. Um, but so I, I, I pull away from that. Events, I, I have to very carefully pick and choose. You know, how do I, how do I balance that piece um, of serving the community? Doing the job is one thing. Going out to the events and being seen to be doing the job is the second part of it. And, and that's the part quite often that I will sacrifice to ensure that um, my wife gets the dinner out she wants, or time down with friends at the boat, or whatever it might be. Uh, so that's the part that's the toughest, is to look and say, I'd really like to be there, but I'm not going to be. So my, my favorite, I think you're, Dennis is right, you're going to hear that we, we like the people, that's, you know, this is a job where you, where you meet a lot of people, so for me it's uh, meeting residents, spending time with residents, and, and seeing residents when they're happy, when you come to an event like Canada Day, or you're walking around the lake in the, in, you know, Christmas time in December, and you'll be walking behind somebody, you'll hear, look at the lights, isn't this wonderful, we're so lucky to live here in Coquitlam, and, and that really means something, when you, when you hear that people are appreciative, and I think we have a very appreciative uh, uh, population here in Coquitlam, our residents, the, the citizen satisfaction survey that we do each year shows that our residents are really happy, and that means that we're doing our job, that we're providing the services that, that people need. Um, people often ask, well, what, is, what are you, the services? And I refer to the five Ps, which is you know, pipes, pavement, parks, protective services, and planning. And those are the things that, that are our core services. But beyond that, it's the, the little things that you do when you can go above and beyond and you help somebody with a problem or, you know, we, we are the level of government that's closest to the people. So we see people more often, they don't know how often you run into your MLA or, you know, you, you're, you certainly don't run into the Prime Minister at Save on Foods here where you run into the mayor. So, you know, we see people a lot and at uh, events or out in the community. And so the ability to engage with people and hear what's important to them, that's what I like the, the most. And, and you know, when you look at some of the things that we've been able to do as, as a council, nobody does anything on their own. It, it takes a collective decision to do it. But when we look at some of the things that we have built since uh, we've been in council, we've got the new YMCA opening and Plasma Yard, and we're planning a community center up in Burke Mountain. Those are things that people are gonna make a difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, kids are going to learn to swim in these uh, facilities. Uh, this, we have some of the best fields for kids for playing soccer. And when we get to go out to a soccer tournament, maybe we hand out a trophy or something, the best part is when you see those kids having a good time using the facilities that we're, we're providing for them. And it, it, the whole range of services from, you know, programming for seniors and centers for seniors and uh, parks and rec and trails and all the things that we're able to um, approve and, and pass for the citizens here. That's, I think, 
to me that's what's most fulfilling the hard part is there's 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 a couple things that are hard one is making decisions that we can't be in two places at one time where you really want to be able to go to this function or you have family commitments or you know you, you just want to be able to do everything and you have to realize this is that you have to put limits you can't do everything so that's sometimes hard is to decide you know are you going to go on that uh, you know economic development uh, um, trip versus going to uh, a, a graduation ceremony or something so you know those are some of the tough the tough decisions the I wouldn't say, you know, I, the two hardest parts, I wouldn't say the things I like uh, that I hate, but the two hardest things I think are, one is that with social media today, you get a lot of criticism that you can't necessarily defend because you're not there to inform people. And a lot of what's written and said in the community is based on misinformation or lack of information. And I think that's really frustrating when people make an assumption or form an opinion without knowing all of the facts. And you know, and I will occasionally, somebody will come, like my wife will come up and say, look, but they're saying how this is so wrong. And we'll sort of say it's because they don't understand or they haven't had, they, you know, certainly not everybody agrees with every decision we make, but you wanna make sure that people have enough information to form an opinion. And that sometimes doesn't happen, particularly in today's media, where you're not always getting both sides of a story, particularly on social media. So I find that very hard. The other thing that I think is sort of not something that I don't like, but I think something that's hard in this job, and, and I've, I've said this a couple of times, and I've said it to, uh, in a, in a, in recently in a radio interview when they were talking about uh, um, housing and citizens that may not like the growth in the community. And I said the hardest thing that we do is we have to make decisions for people who don't live here yet. And that's not always popular with the people who live here today. And so we have to think 10, 20, and 30 years out, whereas most residents are concerned about what's happening in their neighborhoods today and the impact it has on their lives. And so we have to balance building a community for the future while still respecting the lifestyles and the, the surroundings and, and the communities that people chose to move to today. And so that's, that's a, it's a difficult, decision that we have to make and uh, some decisions are, are easy some are some are harder um, but at the end of the day I think that we as a council come together and, and I think that most times I think when we look back now and I'm able to look back 10 years with decisions I made 10 years ago and I think generally most of the decisions that we made uh, have proved to be the right decisions but at the time we often struggled with those decisions Thank you. Uh it's, it's been a, an incredible three and a half years. Uh, you know, for me, the best thing is, like my colleagues, the people. And I think back to the start of the pandemic and through the course of the past the over two years, and the thing that really resonates with me is that our city really responded as much as it could. Um, and, you know, I think about uh, our ability to remove politics from uh, the, the, our, our staff who created an, an EOC, an emergency uh, operations center, uh, and to get out there so that we could try to create the right programs uh, for everyone uh, with limited information at the beginning, but as it progressed uh, over the course of time. And one of the things uh, for myself is uh, a lot of our seniors uh, who were at Dogwood or Glen Pine were suddenly isolated at home and weren't able to go in. And the city responded by creating uh, a senior meals program. And, uh, and for myself, I was able to uh, uh, fortunately have to find a way to um, volunteer and drive and, and deliver those meals. And you start to see the impact that our programs and our volunteers are having right now, right then, on people's lives. And, uh, to see that response, and uh, you know, to my colleagues and, and to staff, um, that was just one part of the program. It was to help nonprofit groups, small businesses, um, and uh, and other areas of, for our residents, so that they can may, maybe, hopefully, make life a little bit easier uh, during that time. And uh, for me, that's just a highlight to show uh, just a, an incredible um, community first. Um, a 
guess, city hall that we have that I firmly believe in. It's, a, it's been incredible to see. Um, as for the least favorite, that's, that's a tough one for me. Uh, you know, it, it's certainly I, I, the hardest part, um, and I agree with, uh, uh, with my colleagues here, is sometimes of trying to make the right decisions and what you feel uh, is the best thing for our community. Um, and I, as a first termer, uh, you really do struggle. Um, and the hardest part is that with even the best decisions, one person uh, might not feel that the decision was right for them. And uh, yet, uh, you, you have to have some uh, resolve to, 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 and some belief that uh, the information that's provided that in time and time and time again, now that I've seen some of these decisions over the long term do provide um, the benefits uh, to uh, the area or to residents uh, or to uh, uh, different organizations. So it, it, you, it, it, you take good comfort in knowing that as you struggle through some of these um, decisions that uh, uh, over time they do uh, show the results that you want. Um, but uh, when it really comes down to my least favorite thing, and I think Richard hit it, um, and that's politics, which is kind of <coughs> ironic. Um, but uh, when I, during my working career, uh, when I was working with uh, various businesses, um, the, the thing that I always avoided was office politics. It just never, uh, not, not something I wanted to be involved in, uh, not something I enjoyed, and uh, something that I, I tended to avoid. Um, and um, sure enough, funny enough, I go into a, a lifestyle that uh, um, is, uh, can uh, have, um, I guess, uh, politics involved. Um, but I, I will have to say at the city of Coquitlam, if you so choose to run and you're successful, uh, you can be sure that uh, there's a culture of, uh, uh, of uh, I guess, of community-minded people who want to do best and uh, that ability to collaborate with each other, um, it goes so far. It, it, it's, uh, it really does um, make, uh, I believe, uh, our city stand out. Um, I won't go into some of our neighboring jurisdictions, but uh, I, I think about when I meet some of our peers at some of these conferences, I, I take strong comfort knowing that uh, the Coquitlam, my colleagues, we're there together. Um, and uh, you'll see some other cities where their counselors are on the opposite sides of the room. Um, and you're wondering to yourself, how did they get anything done? Um, so uh, I really uh, I can't emphasize that enough, uh, 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 how great that is uh, for us to be able to serve in that um, environment as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we would like to open it up to the audience if you have any questions. I know us, uh, Richard is uh, probably go home now. But right. before you before you leave, you probably need to hear this. Uh, I have friends uh, live, who live in uh, Maple Ridge, around the Terry, and they told me that uh, they, for some reason they're following your blog every day. And he told me you're the best mayor in the world. I <laughs> 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 we, we heard to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he sounded pretty good. Right? I tell right you. There. <laughs> and also they said um, you're lucky. You're living in Coquitlam, so kudos to all the uh, council members. You, you, you guys did a good job. Thank you. So my question is regarding voting participation. Um, we know we really have a bad voting participation across Canada. Um, I'm just wondering what you all have done to increase voter engagement. That has always been a I get puzzled by that because we're the people closest to the residents, but there's 26% voter turnout, and half or much less than federal or provincial. Federal is, you know, airports, immigration, it's really high level. Schools and hospitals for provincial, but we're like every year, every day, you know, getting the lane paved or getting the playground, get books in the library. So I've, Tried to do my best to engage with youth, and so my kids both turned 20 and 18 during this term. So I've gained them as voters and all of their friends. So I've tried to, no, but I've tried to really engage them. 
if you, they say that if you vote in your very first election that you're eligible for, then you will be a voter. If you don't start voting as soon as you're eligible, this is statistically, then you're more apathetic and don't bother voting. So I've been doing my best to engage the youth, the leaders of tomorrow, the residents of tomorrow, and other people too. Another thing I'm trying to do is, well, and all of us, is, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. We have to all do what we can to get voter turnout. I had something else really good to say, but I forgot what it was. Dennis. Well, Dennis' fault, I think. Oh, yeah. So, it's, it's my fault. It's my fault. Um, you're right. Uh, voter turnout sucks in municipalities. Um, you know, 26% last time, and that was a high. You know, so I think uh, oh. over the last three, it's been 21, 25, 26. Take your turn. Okay. okay. When I was door knocking last time, I would door knock. <clears throat> People would answer the door and go, I don't vote. And I would just, sometimes I would say, can I just ask you why? Can you just take a second for me and ask me why? And some people just slam the door in your face, or you're all pigs at the trough, or things like that. But the most people that answered me when I asked them why they didn't vote, they said to me, because I'm happy. My garbage gets picked up, my kid plays soccer on a nice field, I feel safe. Yeah, the water, like they, they say that they're happy. And people don't realize that you don't only vote when you're mad. If you're happy with what's going on, you need to vote to reelect those people. But a lot of people, I really learned, the more I asked last time, that was more and more what I found out, is people don't vote because they're happy. So some ways of looking at that is, do we have low, low voter turnout because Coquitlam people are happy rather than apathetic? I don't know, but I think we all can play a part in really getting the word out that it's election year and to take the five minutes to vote. So I sense a new comms piece coming out. If you're happy, you know it, cast your vote. <laughs> ah. so, uh, I don't you don't predict that. You don't predict that, Um Yeah, you know what, I think the, the Terry, Terry's touched on some of it. Um, I recall when I, when I ran the first time, I had a similar guy's front lawn and talked to him for half an hour. Half an hour. Answered his questions, gave him my perspectives, and in the end he says, thanks, I appreciate your time. I'm not gonna vote. And I said, why? He goes, because I never have. I just don't. So um, I, I think in, in large part, I don't, I don't think it's apathy. No. Um, I, I think in, in large part, we take for granted what we have. Uh, and think it's just there. It's all good. So it's just going to continue. Not, not thinking that it can turn into heartbeat. That all of a sudden, if you if you like the concept of parks and rec centers being constructed, if suddenly you put a, a group of people there that want to cut costs and all expenses and everything, and not not invest in the infrastructure you have, it rots and falls away, and they have problems. So uh, your question is, what are we doing to encourage it? Uh, much like uh, Terry. I've got a young family, they're voting age, and I, I engage their, their friends, because they're the next voters. Um, you know, um, we'll, we'll go, when we go to events, we'll engage with people. Um, like you used the example, Terry, of the serving tea of the seniors uh, at Dogwood. Um, you know, we had a couple hundred volunteers at, at Dogwood. They're not all voters. They actually don't show up and vote. Some of you have a conversation, and, and they don't. So encouraging them to do that, encouraging them to get out and, and see that. Um, I, I'm, I'm open to ideas on what we might do. Uh, we've had some, there, there's some dialogue on, on doing some things, uh, mail-in ballots uh, has been what has uh, been suggested. Uh, Burnaby's tried it. Uh, they found their turnout was marginal uh, difference, uh, but a significant cost implication. Um, so, you know, I'm certainly open to looking at, at new ideas. If you've got some, you know, bring them forth. Uh, and, and it's a matter of, obviously, provincially, we've decided to stay with first past the post. Um, that's the system we have. Um, and I don't know how you do a different system if you don't have party politics. The, uh, the when you start choosing parties, we don't have them. How would something other than first past the post work here? So. I'm uh, certainly open to it, but it's just, it's about educating people, let them, let them know, get out. Um, 
and and really part of that piece is the flyer. Thank you, Terry. it out there. Thank you. See you, Terry. Um, letting people know that you've got some good people running for council, and and the one thing that's really important to me is you got to realize that it is a three hundred million dollar budget. We got about one hundred and fifty million dollars in property taxes collected every year. There's significant decisions that this board needs to make. And we need the people, the residents, deciding who's going to make those decisions for them. Because it's a lot of money and a lot of significant stuff that's setting up the next 50 years. I'll just add on, no, I just said it's absolutely great. I think that uh, one of the things that we, the city have done is that certainly the, the mail out is, uh, I think, key. Um, the other thing that uh, we've done is we've, uh, we've, we're using more advanced polls so that people who can't necessarily vote on Saturday, it's, Saturday can be a busy day, especially if you've got young kids, so we've increased the number of advanced polls, we've distributed them throughout the city, uh, we've made sure that uh, we have uh, uh, mobile polls for some people who can't get out. Um, so there's there's been a number of things that we have done. There has been talk about you know mail-in balloting and online, but to me, what's really important is that the people who are voting are engaged. I'd rather have people who understand the issues and are making informed decisions as opposed to people that are just you know it's, it's more than just trying to drive the numbers up. I want to have more engaged people uh, voting, and, and that starts with getting good candidates to run uh, for us as councillors to to explain what the city does, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the five Ps, I think a lot of people don't understand uh, what their city council does until something goes wrong, until suddenly the water doesn't flow into the, into the house or out of the house or the pavement's gone or the roads don't get plowed, then people take up the notice. And I, I think there's a little, to be, you know, what Terry said, that when people are happy, I wouldn't say they become apathetic, but I don't think they, they become motivated or that they don't notice things as much. And so I think what we have to do is, uh, is reach out to people and say, if you like what's going on in the city, these are the, you know, this is the process for making sure that it continues. And if you don't like the way things are going in the city, this is the process to, to make change. And I think that's really the key, is just to reach out to as many people, uh, especially people who are new to the community, whether they're new to the country or they're new to the community, and, and that's one of the things that we've also tried to do. I think that our council is representative of that, uh, of that community now. Uh, we're trying to become more diverse in, uh, in, in attracting our candidates so that people can look and sort of say, ah, there's people who have the same values as me or want the same things as me. And I think that will get people to come out and, and vote. All the above, you know. <laughs> Um, that's all you need to see. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it, it's a challenge. Uh, and certainly, uh, I, I do believe uh, engagement with, uh, with, with people and uh, groups and demographics that don't typically uh, vote. Um, and I think youth was, uh, you know, we've got to get more youth involved. Uh, we have to get uh, uh, various uh, you know, newcomer groups, uh, who, who, whoever it might be, to understand. Um, uh, that their vote has that power to, to change the future of the city. Um, I, you know, it's interesting to me when we hear how, you know, when everyone's happy and they're not voting, because um, uh, on the flip side of that, I think about how, especially in this world that we live in, that elections can be so uh, vitriolic, it can be so uh, negative, um, and, you know, there, there are some um, in, in other jurisdictions who would think that that's the way that they need to get people to turn out to vote, but on the flip side of that, that can totally turn people off and, and just avoid it altogether. Um, so in, in my hope is that uh, a, you know, a positive discourse, a, a positive dialogue on where we want to go with the city is what can inspire people to want to get involved in the world to vote as well. So, uh, you know, but 26% uh, is just, that's just not good enough. A uh, quick follow-up question. I know it's not your decision, but what do you think about the implementation of a system like Australia where you're actually forced to vote? Or at least fined if you don't bother voting. I think it would be stupid. I, and, and I'll explain it this way. 
in Australia, they have more spoiled spoil ballots than uh, any other jurisdiction I know of because people know they have to vote. They don't know the issues. They don't care about the issues. And so they go there and mark an X anywhere and they put the ballot in that. That didn't get us anywhere. Um, uh, I think Craig said, I, I want more engaged people. So how do we get them engaged enough, from my perspective, how do we get them engaged enough so they need to vote? Because once you're engaged, you won't miss an election because you have issues you want to advance. You, 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 either you want change, or so you want to drive for a different uh, direction, or you like the direction we're in and you want to support that, you'll need to vote. Um, right now, the, most seniors vote. So young people say, well, why don't we get bike parks? Because seniors don't use bike parks. <laughs> um, in a lot of communities, that's the reality, which we're, you know, we, we are, advance a whole bunch of youth-related programming. But when I was first elected, it was 20%. 20% voter turnout. And we got it all the way up to 26. Wow, big success. Um, and by-elections are worse. The, for, the first by-election I saw was 4.9% turnout, 4.9. Um, uh, one voter in 20 turned out to vote in the by-election. The next one, we added some uh, referendum questions you know, about Monday Park off-leash and smoking in on patios. And as a result, we ended up with voter turnout in that by-election of 7.5%, which was amazing. We thought it was just like, wow, we got 7.5%, which still means that one in 15 voters uh, was engaged. Uh, that's not enough. So absolutely. Um, to answer the question bluntly, forcing people to vote is not the answer. Making them need to vote, making them desperately want to vote is the answer. So that they'll dig in, find out the stuff, be an informed voter, and they'll cast the ballot that, that works for the community. Okay. That's all that did. Um, yeah, very, very similar. So in one of the elections, uh, I, I volunteered and I was uh, helping drive them to the polls. Folks that uh, didn't have transport, wanted to get out to the polls, pick them up, take them to the polls. And I was standing there uh, while the lady was uh, going to cast her ballot. There's a, a young couple come in, they, they go to vote, and they finish, they walk out. The young lady says to the young man, who'd you vote for? He says, nobody. She says, what do you mean, we came here to vote. He goes, well, yeah, but I don't know what's up. So, yeah, I registered, but I didn't vote for anybody, cause, but I told my dad I'd vote, so I showed up. And I, I, I think, unfortunately, um, while I appreciate what Australia's perhaps done to say, thou shalt vote, it needs to be deeper than that. And again, it needs to be that understanding. I had a conversation with, um, when I was the chamber president with Adrian Dix, the time was the leader of the NDP uh, about about municipal elections, and, and he said he was in Vancouver. He goes, there was seventy plus names on the ballot. He goes, I follow politics a bit. <laughs> the leader of a, of, a, of a provincial party. I follow politics a bit. He goes, even I don't have the time to research all those people to know what they stand for. So even he had difficulty knowing which way to go. So parties worked for him because it was, he could just pick a party. Um, but I did, looking and saying, just blank, you gotta do it. I, I don't believe that's the solution. There's probably a number of steps that have to be taken before we could even consider getting there. Yeah, I'll go back to my, my first answer. We all want more people at the polls, but I want people who are coming out to vote for something or to vote for a change. So I, I want, people who are informed and engaged uh, to be the ones casting their votes and uh, we just have to find uh, more ways to get those people informed and engaged and, uh, and I think then we'll see the, uh, the voter turnout uh, increase. Nothing to add to this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So it's just past eight, and I know Mrs. Stewart has been waiting over an hour for her husband to come home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, go ahead and ask the question. And then. So in your last term, uh, which project you're most proud of, and which one is the opposite?
Um, project that I'm most proud of? Yes. Um, I, I think there, there, there's two. Um, there, I mean, there's been so many projects, um, but the, the two that immediately come to mind are the YMCA project in Berkwillam, um, because it delivers a 60,000 square foot rec facility uh, that our residents uh, have access to. Um, and part of that project was 300 units of rental housing with 100 of them subsidized below market, managed by uh, 43 housing, so, um, which is shared family services. So that is a significant one because it's putting affordable housing right by SkyTrain and it's putting a recreation facility again right there alongside it. So you've got folks across the full socioeconomic scale are going to be able to live right next to a rec facility so they can have a healthy life and the supports they want. Uh, and the second one is the uh, Place Maraville replacement, uh, a 10,000 square foot or 11,000 square foot building that was well past end of life. That when I first ran for office in 2008, I sat on the stage and said, yeah, we gotta get the funding to make this happen and replace it. And we finally did, we'll be, uh, it'll be open in the fall. Um, but uh, that's a significant one again, because they deliver so many specific services uh, into the into the South Coquitlam area. So those are those are two big ones that come to mind, but there is a plethora of affordable housing uh, and, and 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 that's probably the most important thing we've, we've really done is the affordable housing strategy that we've created. Um, these other ones are deliverables as a result of that framework of policy, which again comes back to policy. You want one? Okay, we'll start with the ones that uh, we're really happy with in this current term. Uh, certainly, uh, Place Maillard uh, was one that, uh, as Dennis said, was one that we've been waiting for years to do. Uh, when I first came on to council, one of my committees was the Maillardville uh, uh, Economic and Revitalization Committee. And so that is going to, that new center opening is going to have a, a, a big benefit to that part of the city, a, a part of the city that hasn't seen a lot of investment up until now. And so that's going to be the catalyst, I think, for redevelopment in that area. Uh, I would say one of the other big things that we accomplished certainly was uh, uh, completing the uh, uh, low heat uh, Burkutlam uh, community plan, the OCP for that area. And while planning doesn't sound exciting, that's creating housing, both affordable housing and, and rental housing, and housing for, uh, for people to live that are coming to that community. And that's gonna be a whole new neighborhood built in an area that was primarily uh, single family homes, uh, uh, homes that, uh, apartments that needed to be replaced in strip malls and parking lots. So we're actually building a community there, and uh, we've done the same with another community plan at Coquitlam at uh, City Centre here, and uh, and I think that's uh, that's going to be something that's going to be a lasting legacy as we go forward and see those areas redevelopment. So I think a couple of the plans that we did are key, and uh, but my say you know, my favorite place in, uh, in here is uh, is what we've been doing at City Centre or at uh, Town Centre Park and the improvements that we continue to make at the, the Farge Lake and the, the uh, Entertainment Plaza and the trails and the, and the lights and what we've done there because that's become a really great gathering place with over a million visitors a year now. And so I think that's when, when I go down there to get an ice cream cone or something to walk around the lake, I look around that and say, wow, this is a fantastic spot. You see the new high rises coming in there and people moving in that are going to uh, call this area home. And I think that's uh, been great. Um, and on the, on the redo, on the do over, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think why don't we do all the good and then we'll come back because I need some time to think on that one as well. I, I can't really think of it. This being my first term, uh, it's, you know, it, it's one where I remember uh, some of the inf some of the decisions that I made early in the term uh, you know, on infrastructure, it was great for me to see things actually being built. Uh, whether it was also fixing some of the roads or uh, some of the sidewalks, uh, you see that your decisions have impact almost um, quite quickly. Um, but uh, you know, it's hard for me to go into individual projects. Uh, certainly the YMCA and uh, Class of Maryardville, <clears throat> but some of them also started before my time, so I'm carrying the torch here. Um, but I look at strategies. 
that we're putting on. And as Dennis uh, mentioned at the beginning, our affordable housing strategy. Uh, through that, we have over a thousand non-market and below-market rentals um, in stream. Um, incredible numbers that, uh, that uh, of units, and these are needed. Uh, I look at uh, our, during this term, we, we we completed the environmental sustainability strategy for the city. We are working on childcare strategies. Um, it, some meaningful strategies that we are working on that will have, I guess, downstream impact on various projects moving forward. Um, and uh, you know, when I sit back in the last and think about the last two and a half years, I take great pride in, in, in that work. Um, and uh, then to be at the table to, to be part of that discussion. Um, but uh, as for, or, and one other thing with the infrastructure, uh, and I know everyone shares this, is that we are creating this active transportation network. Uh, and for me growing up here, you, you know, like the first thing in high school, everyone, the first friend of yours to get their driver's license was needed so that you had some mobility. We, it took us two hours on the 151 to go to Vancouver, or uh, or you really uh, did stay within your neighborhood. And here is Coquitlam today, where you I, I can't believe the opportunity to, to get around uh, um, uh, walking, riding a bike, or, uh, or taking um, rapid transit. So uh, that is truly amazing to me. Um, as for least favorite, to be honest, uh, I'll give you a, a you know, it might seem like a politician's answer, but I, I don't have it. Um, uh, one thing I've learned through our council is that it, it's a it's an iterative process. It's an ongoing discussion and dialogue. So ultimately, when we come to a decision and a project happens, we've exhausted the discussion on what the pros and cons are, and we ultimately come up with something that I believe, at the end, uh, that is, uh, you know, that is, uh, that has, I guess, there's value in that project or decision. Um, so uh, um, I'm pretty happy with uh, the way things have gone so far. But we have, I guess, limited sample size, but. <laughs> what did it reduce? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, I'm going to back up just a little bit for 30 seconds. Some of the big, biggest business failures are because uh, the CEO or the founder of a company or whatever surrounds himself by people who think just like him uh, or her. And as a result, they make a mistake. And it's a, an enormous mistake because they're, it's an echo chamber. Um, you know, our council is people that think completely differently. We're across the political spectrum. We have diverse backgrounds. We are a really different set of people and yet we're able to work together. And so for us to have something that we think turned out to be a real mistake meant that all nine of us, because we go based on primarily on consensus, we already ever have like a six to three vote or a four to five vote or something. Um, all nine of us have to be wrong in order for us to all to, to make a wrong decision. And, I, and so, and then we have, we have, there's no question that, well, we should have done it this way or whatever. Um, the thing I'm proudest about for uh, is the thing I ran for in 2008. I, I decided to try for mayor because we had been 20 years trying to get this guy trained to uh, Coquitlam. 25 years at that point. It was supposed to be the next line built after the Expo line in 1986. Um, then it was, of course, it went elsewhere. It went over to Surrey, and then it went back to Vancouver, and then it went out to Richmond, and we were still waiting for. So it meant having to work with lots of communities, go to every city hall, sit down with the mayor, try to figure out how to get a consensus at the TransLink Mayor's Council table and funding at the provincial and federal levels to get SkyTrain to Coquitlam. Um, and having achieved that, we SkyTrain opened in December 2015 and it immediately showed its benefit. We then adapted the neighborhood plans that others have talked about, the neighborhood plan in Perquitlam, the one in the city center, um, in order to allow that we got the density. The, the thing that the public might think as negative, and we hear it all the time, is that I don't like the high rises. I, I don't like all this high density housing. Um, why can't Coquitlam stay as a single family neighborhood like it was when I was growing up and it was 49,000 people 
the tier. Why can't it be like that? And we've already said we have to accommodate population growth. We have to. It's an imperative. We have to accommodate the population that moves here, or else our kids will move out here uh, from here. That's it's simple. It happens everywhere where local governments aren't able to keep up with housing demand. It's been mentioned that um, uh, some of the housing initiatives, our affordable housing strategy, actually embraces, it encourages, it supports, incentivizes the creation of rental housing and non-market rental housing to the point where Coquitlam has more rental housing in stream per capita than anybody in British Columbia. We have more non-market, not subsidized by the provincial government, but non-markets that's cross-subsidized within in Coquitlam. More of that in stream than any other jurisdiction per capita in British Columbia. And it's been incentivized rather than by the, by the stick or by relying on massive federal grants and provincial grants. So those are things I'm proud of. I'm gonna to go to the negative because, and it's not something we did, it's something we haven't been able to do yet. Um, <coughs> the Burnett overpass of Highway 1, for that matter, Low Heat Highway in front of Crease Clinic, in front of Riverview. There are massive investments that are needed by senior levels of government to improve infrastructure. Because our hospital, we can see it from most of Coquitlam, but we can't get to it. That's the Royal Columbia the Regional Hospital um, because of that bottleneck. And we have still a lot of work to do to work with New Westminster, work with the provincial government, and identify solutions to that mess so that uh, Coquitlam citizens can get to the regional hospital in this community. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I may have to cut you off. <laughs> See, I'm the library trustee. She hosts two guys, right? <laughs> so she just said to shut me out, whatever she was. It's awesome. I'm taking notes as to how to do that. <laughs> wasn't successful, Dan, it's all yours. Um, thank you very much, Mayor Stewart and councillors for coming here. We really appreciate this. I hope you learned about what it takes to be a city councillor. I certainly own it, and I were like, I didn't know anything. Yeah, I will be, because I don't live in Burnaby. I live in Burnaby, and that is not the good. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> and my husband and I have had conversations about moving to Google, so. That. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you again, and go vote. Like, go vote. My, yeah, my dad was a social studies teacher all his life, and he made us vote in every election. I have voted in every election. Even when I lived overseas, I voted um, in absentia, or whatever it's called, because it was instilled in me. And I tell that to my teens all the time, you have to vote. If you don't vote, you have no power. So... Thank you again very much for coming and thank you to all of you for